Hey guys, welcome to the channel. It's Jack with Stronghold Strength and Conditioning. And today, I've got the ultimate guide to resolving your lower back pain. But before we get into that, make sure you take a moment and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss out on future content like this. Every Thursday, I'm putting out videos on how to resolve aches and pains, prevent injuries, and overall optimize your performance. It doesn't get much better than that. So take a moment and click that button. Ready? Let's go ahead and get into this one. It's a doozy. All right, guys. So I recently had a comment saying, you should do a video on lower back pain. Well, you asked and you shall receive. So here is my response to that comment. And what I'm putting out is just a general ultimate guide to resolving lower back pains. And I'm gonna try and cover as much ground as possible. There is a lot to it here, so I'm gonna do my best to organize it as well as possible for you. So the way we're gonna approach fixing your lower back pain is gonna be structured in this sense. So first of all, we wanna look at joint mechanics and we wanna address the major joints that play a role in the overall lower back pain that you could be getting. The reality is that if the structure is off or if there's limited range of motion at certain joints, that that is gonna be a major player in your lower back pain overall. So we'll take a look at that first. Then we're gonna look at the soft tissues that surround the lower back and those tissues that could be playing a major role as far as causing pain. If there's dysfunction at those tissues, that they could be um, common causes of lower back pain. So we're gonna address the soft tissues that surround that area next. And then finally, we wanna look at the overall movement patterning, which is your coordination of movement. And we wanna make sure that that is um, addressed because if you know what's going wrong at the joint mechanics, and if you know how to fix the soft tissue problems that you're having or the dysfunction at the soft tissues, it really won't matter if you still move improperly and have poor coordinated movement time and time again. You'll just find yourself in a cyclical, I'm injured or I have pain and then I'm able to resolve it. I'm injured and I have pain and then I'm able to resolve it. But I move wrong and that's causing it all the time. So if we don't fix that movement patterning, then that's gonna be a big player in the overall game here. So that's gonna be how we're gonna be looking at it and I'm gonna try and keep it as concise as I can while giving you as all the information you need here, but there really is a lot that could be going into your lower back pain because we are a system of systems, and usually it's not as simple as just one thing. It might be kind of peel back a layer and then discover a new area that might be playing into your lower back or pain, peel back another layer. So, without further ado, Let's get into this stuff here. So the very first thing, as I mentioned, that we're gonna be talking about is the joint mechanics themselves. And we wanna be looking at, first of all, not directly at the lumbar spine necessarily, but a lot of the joints that are directly below and directly above that would be playing into excessive arch or work of that lumbar spine. So let's go to, first of all, the uh, pelvis and sacrum because those are usually one of the main problems that we see in most people is anterior pelvic tilt. So it's the idea that our pelvis is actually tipped forward which puts excessive arch in the lumbar spine to allow us to be able to stand upright without having to lean over because of that shape that we've taken. So our body is changing the overall structure that we've been intended to have putting more work on the lumbar spine and putting more pressure on the lumbar spine. It's one thing to do that when you're not carrying anything around, but the problem is that we take that shape into when we're working around the house and carrying things around or when we're going to the gym and working out and we keep working through movements with limited range of motion and mobility because we don't have good organization of our spinal column. The very first thing that is of importance is 
the ability to organize and stabilize that spinal column. And the pelvis and sacrum is the lowest region of our spinal column. So when we lack the ability to actually keep our pelvis in a neutral position, we are automatically breaking down the system above, throwing that lumbar spine out of arrangement and making it work harder. The other thing just above that lumbar spine is our thoracic spinal column. And when we lack the ability to extend at the thoracic spinal column and we're chronically stuck in more of a flexed position, which is rounded shoulders, cave chest, that also begins to put more pressure on the lumbar spine itself. Think rounded shoulders pulling already at the lumbar spine. And if you do that right now, you can feel that rounding. If you do it, pull at the low back to begin with. So we already put excess stress on the lumbar spine from two very common positions that we see associated with societal demands that we sit a lot at work, we sit in a car a long time, we sit at home a lot. So anterior pelvic tilt is a big problem as well as flexion of that thoracic spine with the inability to access extension when we have it. Now, like I said, Overall, if we simplify that down to one thing, it's the ability to organize and stabilize your spinal column with the natural curves that they should have and proper alignment. So it's one thing to be able to organize and stabilize the spinal column when we're just standing or lying. It's a whole nother thing once again when we add a load or we start to exercise on that. And that's where later on we'll be talking more about the actual functional movement patterns and being able to maintain that. But we need to know that right here to begin with is if I don't have a good core brace that I'm already going to suffer and be putting my lumbar spine at risk. It's just one of the most common ones because the fact that it gets caught in the middle of poor pelvic control and poor thoracic mobility. It's as simple as that with those. Now, the other important ones we need to look at are the main drivers that help us keep that core brace once we have it established. And that would be our hips and our shoulders. Let's talk a little bit about the shoulders first actually here. So a lot of times from that excessive flexion of the thoracic spine or the thoracic spine that's stuck in flexion, we see protracted and elevated scapula. And we're kind of stuck in that range of motion where my shoulder gets stuck in an internally rotated position. The reality is I lack internal rotation at the glenohumeral joint, that ball and socket joint, and probably lack some external rotation there. Most people are lacking both of those, which inhibits my ability to generate torque at the shoulder or the hip, creating a more stable positioning for the shoulder and hip. The thing that we need to understand here is what's a concept called global stability. And it's the idea that my spinal organization and stability is dependent upon my ability to generate torque at the shoulders and the hips and vice versa. My ability to generate quality torque at the shoulders and the hips is dependent upon my ability to organize my spinal column. So if one or the other suffers, it automatically is going to make the other one suffer on top of that. So it's very important that I have access to the full range of motion at the shoulder joint that I should have and the full range of motion at the hip joint, the ball and socket joints. Think that, ball and socket joint. And when we jump back down to the hip here, it's not uncommon to see that we lack the full extension of the hip as well as external rotation of the hip in this. Normally, our shoulders and our hips are actually um, usually stuck in an anterior rotated position and medial rotation. So we kind of are caving inwards and collapsing in on ourselves. So it's organizing the, sta organizing the spinal column, stabilizing the spinal column, and then being able to generate torque from the shoulders and hip. Now the foot and ankle are a big part of this torsion of the system of the leg specifically. So 
I might be able to create external rotation at the hip, but if I lack mobility and the actual intrinsic strength of the foot that I need, then there's a good chance that my base is gonna be all off and that's gonna automatically make my system collapse. My feet are hugely important here and it's really important that I know what a good base is to begin with. So when we set our base when we're standing, it's important that we have two tripods that we're working off of. The first metatarsal of the, the foot, the fifth metatarsal of the foot, and the heel. That makes a tripod on each side that we should be able to feel contacting the floor. Then from there with that tripod set we need to make sure that we're working with good mechanics. My feet should be anywhere from 0 to 30 degrees and, and not much turned out any further than that honestly. The reason being if you kind of turn your feet out past 30 degrees you should notice what automatically begins to happen at the arch of your foot and it's that the arch of our foot naturally begins to cave inward and collapse. And that is an example of us losing the ability to generate quality torque at the hip. So if my feet turn out, and usually you see this from individuals who do lack stability to begin with, it's their body's way of trying to compensate and create some type of stability at the hip. The feet are turning out, the foot is collapsing. We need to keep those feet somewhere parallel to one another or in that zero to 30 degree range so that we can screw our feet into the floor when we're standing in place and feel that torsion go up the system of the leg into the hip, stabilizing the pelvis and beginning to organize our spinal column from the feet all the way up through the shoulders, the head, the neck. So it's Whatever my base is, my feet here, I need to be able to organize my spinal column above that using torsion through the leg in order to generate stability at the hip and stabilizing the pelvis beginning to organize the spinal column. So if I lack mobility at the ankle when I go to twist and screw those feet into the ground, what we normally will see is that the feet want to roll off the floor and I lose contact of that first metatarsal and it completely puts all the pressure on that fifth metatarsal and the heel losing a lot of balance as well. That is a big part of organizing and making sure that our joint mechanics are working properly. So shoulder and hip, full range of motion, internal and external rotation, the ability of the foot to actually grip the floor, creating its natural arch, making sure that I can splay the foot and have um, a good, nice wide base with those toes not being crimped and uh, dysfunctionally uh, kind of pushed into one another, think bunions. Uh, and from there, that ankle being able to also pass the torsion up from the foot into the hip. That is our organization of the skeletal structure. Now, to test the organization of the spinal column and make sure that I'm able to actually maintain a good neutral spinal column without, um, without a load at first, it's important that we test supinated positions. And one of my favorites is the supine low hold. So I like to set this because we can use the floor as a good reference point for what is a neutral spinal column. And as soon as we lift the feet from the floor on the supine low hold, we'll be able to tell if I have any of these inabilities to create stability at the pelvis or at the shoulder. What you'll see is if I lack stability at the pelvis, and the lumbar range is as soon as I lift those feet from the floor, my low back is gonna create an excessive arch. Now on the other hand, if I lack the stability or at the, I have poor positioning and stability is usually on the anterior portion of my body, from the shoulder and thoracic spine, you'll see that as soon as I lift my feet, my shoulders round and cave inward. And either of these examples are, are clearly showing your lack to organize and stabilize that spinal column, which is the very first place you need to begin. So practice that movement itself until you can get about three sets at 60 seconds, maintaining that neutral spinal position with both feet just hovering over the floor and we're in a fully extended position. So it really resembles standing quite well. 
Working from that super, supinated position a little bit further using glute bridge variations is also my next step here because we want to make sure we are strengthening the glutes well. The thing is, a glute bridge is important, but if you're unable to do the glute bridge without feeling your quads or your hamstrings, you should feel glutes. It's called a glute bridge for a reason. So we want to feel the glutes when we're doing the glute bridge. If we're not doing that, we need to transition to a hip thrust. The fact that the um, angle of the hip thrust brings us level in a tabletop position, that provides us the ability to actually access the glutes more. And when we're using the glutes, we should have basically two different things going on. Full extension of the pelvis upward and an external rotation or a knee drive wide is the best way to think of it. And if you can't do both those at the same time, up with the hips and out wide with the knees, then you might be lacking one of those two, um, two movements specifically. And basically, if you're trying the glute bridge or the hip thrust, it should be able to, you should be able to identify it based off of what you're unable to do. Are the hips dropping? If, that, if so, you lack extension there. Or if the knees are caving inward or unable to actually push wide as you lift up, then you lack a little bit of that external rotation. These are important things. And you'll, you might notice as you try and drive those knees wide that your foot tries to leave the ground. So it might be telling you a little bit about your foot and ankle mobility lacking as well there. These are positions that we want to start strengthening our ability to stabilize the spinal column in and really start to build up that musculature and train your body what neutral spinal column is from there. Once we get well, once we're able to perform those well from the supinated position, it's then that we move to pronated positions such as a plank or a bear crawl position. Those are going to be ones that are a little bit more advanced, but you should first of all use that reference of the floor to help teach your body what organized spinal column is and show you if you're able to actually maintain that stability. These are also exercises you can kind of start to practice that torque and torsion through the floor with, whether it's the supinated position or the pronated positions. So that is the joint mechanics that we should be looking at. It's making sure, first of all, that our pelvis is in a neutral position, and that goes from side to side as well. A lot of times what we'll see is not just anterior pelvic tilt, but if it's not anterior pelvic tilt, that side to side the pelvis is tilted where one hip is actually higher than the other because we favor that side when we're carrying things. Or, you know, it might just be that we've kind of compensated to one side to avoid an injury that maybe we had in the past. Something along those lines. But we want to make sure that either way we have a nice neutral pelvis and spinal column from the, the low range there building up on top of it. So once we have the ability to organize and stabilize the spinal col column and generate torque and we have that range of motion at the hips, we are looking at the actual soft tissues that surround that lumbar region. And generally what we see is, first of all, from anterior pelvic tilt, we see shortened and overactive QL and a shortened and overactive hip flexor range. So what we would do to actually release the QL is use a lacrosse ball under the lumbar spine with the feet elevated on a chair when you're lying in a supinated position. Bracing the abdomen well, taking some nice deep breaths, and searching along the lumbar spinal column, the musculature just off to the side of it, and then over the top of the pelvis, still in the lumbar region there. What we see in the lumbar region is actually a large fascial sheath, and that is the thoracolumbar fascia that we see. And it's the insertion of the lats, it's the insertion of the glutes, we have our QL underneath that's deep to that a little bit. So this is a common point of connection where the obliques run and all these tissues can play into the fact that there's tension and pressure on that thoracolumbar fascia that could be causing your pain. So releasing the QL using the lacrosse ball under the lumbar region of the spine is going to be one place to begin with. After you're neurologically decreasing tone to these tissues, you do want to 
activate the tissues that help bring it back into balance. And this would go back to now using the uh, supine low hold or the glute bridges to strengthen after we mobilize some of the tissues. We'd also want to open up the hip flexors. My gold standard stretch for the hip flexors is the couch stretch. And the couch stretch is honestly going to be very, very telling if you're able to access a fully extended position when the knee is in flexion and the ankle is in a fully plantar flex position. So it's really testing the anterior portion of our leg, that front side of our leg, and what kind of slack we have through the system there. Normally, most people are unable to get to the fully vertical position, but this should be the ultimate goal over time with repetition. So making sure you can access that full vertical position after you've done this time and time again, building up to it. You will know right away if those hip flexors are tight. We should also be able to contract the glutes in this position. This resembles extending the leg on a run in the full extension position back behind us or walking even fully extending the leg back behind us being able to access extension of the glutes there um, extension of the hip feeling the glutes activate while the um, while the hip flexors are actually neurologically decreasing in tone a lot of times from sitting so often we've neurologically stabilized ourselves from the hip flexors which is not what we want to do. We want to bring that back into balance. And that's the goal by using the couch stretch to open up those hip flexors. You can even play with rotation in this position once you get into it and you're able to get vertical. But first get vertical, then you can do a little bit fancier stuff from there and play with rotation. So the gluteals can actually play a role in lower back pain. And if I lack the ability to externally rotate the hip, something like a pigeon pose might be helpful in helping open up that external rotation, but also using a softball around the hip joint and searching those gluteal tissues, specifically higher up around like the glute med where it just attaches in below the ridge of the pelvis there that's gonna be something that might help alleviate some back pain that you might be feeling if it's the gluteals that are playing a role in it, or even the piriformis is a common one that causes back pain. So using a softball to create self myofascial release in that range is gonna be beneficial. Using a foam roller along the lats on the north side of the lumbar spinal column is something that could help as well because our lats connect into that thoracolumbar fascia and if our lats are tight from having a thoracic spinal column that's stuck in flexion and shoulders that are elevated and internally rotated from protraction there as well then my lats are likely to be restricted in movement and I am going to be pulling at my low back a lot there as well. One thing that's commonly mistaken is as far as causing lower back pain is that my hamstrings are tight. Now, oftentimes your hamstrings are tight because they are fully extended because your pelvis is in anterior pelvic tilt. So if you're stretching your hamstrings to try and fix your lower back pain, the reality is it's probably not your hamstrings that are actually that are actually the problem. They are tight because they're at full stretch. It's more that the hip flexors that need to be addressed, the glutes need to be able to engage properly to bring back in balance, and the QL needs to be addressed because it's neurologically overactive as well. That's a common misconception, is that the hamstrings are causing the problem when really, all, they may be tight, but it's simply your body's way of creating stability to try and save itself from uh, just blowing out the hamstrings altogether because they are at fully extend, a fully extended position. So that's where they get that chronic neurological tone and that becomes something that people focus on. Oftentimes though, when we're doing the glute bridge, people will feel their hamstrings and that's because their hamstrings are trying to create the movement when the glutes should be. So that's something to pay attention to. When you do a glute bridge, it's called a glute bridge for a reason. You should not feel your hamstrings or your quadriceps. 
the actual tissues right at the lumbar spine in the obliques can also be a problem if we're kind of stuck in rotation or if, like I said, one hip is higher than the other. In this range, we can use a uh, foam roller to provide self myofascial release to those tissues, or you can use a softball to play in those areas as well, seeing about if the rib cage is actually parallel to the pelvis, that's pretty important. If you can't fit that foam roller through there level and perpendicular basically to the, your body running over it, then there's a chance that you are in anterior pelvic tilt. So you should feel like you have a little bit of a range that you can run that foam roller right through there and be right on those obliques. Now the obliques, once again, tie into thoracolumbar fascia on that posterior side and if we lack rotation or those tissues are tightened, that can be causing pain as well. So just to kind of a recap, check in on your lats, check in on your obliques, check in on your QL, check in on your hip flexors. And if we're releasing all of those and even the glutes, piriformis, those are all tissues that we wanna check in with self myofascial release and see that there's not a um, overactive neurological tone to them. So basically anytime we apply pressure to those tissues, if they're feeding back a lot of discomfort, then there's a good chance that those tissues are neurologically overactive and they'll benefit from that self myofascial release. And last but not least, movement patterning and coordination. So if you are chronically moving poorly, your soft tissues and joints are going to be paying for it because of dysfunctional patterns that your body's going to form to create the movement. So it's very important and I'm not going to be able to get into the full detail of all of these today, but it's very important that you understand how to perform six functional movement patterns in high quality movement. And that is a squat, a hinge, a lunge, a push, a pull, and a carry. If you can master those six fundamental movement patterns, with high quality movement and repeat them time and time again, whether it's the easiest form of it or taking it into more advanced forms, then you will be able to overall protect yourself from these minor aches and pains that you're getting and any other serious injury down the road. It's crucial that we know how to move our bodies the right way because when we move improperly, we are using things that aren't intended to or we're overloading other parts of the system that shouldn't have to carry the burden that they do and by the time we figure it out it's because we have an injury our system is backwards right now we wait for the pain before we actually try and solve the problem it shouldn't be that way we need to be searching through figuring out what's going wrong with our movement and where it's faulty right now before we ever get that pain signal because once we get the pain signal it's like being thirsty you're already dehydrated you're already injuring yourself and putting yourself under stress that doesn't need to happen so if you've got the pain already listen there's ways that you can work out of it and that's not necessarily something that should discourage you. But for those of you who aren't in pain already in this region, then we need to be looking at, okay, am I actually able to maintain these things? Am I moving properly throughout those squat, hinge, lunge, push, pull, carry, whatever it is, insert it there. And am I able to execute that in forms that are carrying over into daily activities that you might have to do or the physical activities that we do around a house. The gym is your lab, the household stuff, that's what we're actually working for. Whatever you can do in the gym needs to be able to carry over to practical use in your household and in your daily life. And there you guys have it my ultimate guide to resolving lower back pain. I know it was a mouthful. I hope I didn't lose you guys in there. And if you have any questions, be sure to drop them down below in the comment section and I will gladly answer them for you. It truly is a lot to answer in just one video here. So I tried to do my best to keep it as concise as possible, but as um, you know, beneficial to you guys and all encompassing as possible of 
as far as what could really be causing your lower back pain. But these were the main ones that really most people I see are dealing with or struggling with in some way, shape, or form. And this is honestly the approach that I would take if I were helping you get work your way back out of it. So we're looking at the joint mechanics, we're looking at the soft tissues that surround them, we're addressing, addressing those things, making sure we can create global stability, and then we're making sure that the movement is high quality outside of that. So if you guys like this video, make sure you let me know by dropping a big thumbs up down below. If you guys have not already, make sure you take a moment and click that subscribe button. Every Thursday I'm putting out videos on how to resolve aches and pains, prevent injuries, and overall optimize your performance. And last but not least, if you guys want something specifically tailored to you or if you need help working your way out of some ache or pain that you have, I would be more than happy to help you with that. Take a moment, drop by the website, and fill out the coaching application, and we'll have you guys headed in the right direction in no time. I want to thank you guys for watching today. We'll see you next time.